Robert. That's me. Occupation? Student? Poet? Traveler? Observer of my fellow man? Wanderer in an age? And your most willing guide? I will make a pact with you. I will speak to you truly. I will not spout legends or tell you hearsay. It is my task to take you through a small part of one of the ages of mankind. You call it the Middle Ages. It is the year 1350. Although in our age, all years are pretty much alike. We are, well, almost anywhere. Frenchmen, Englishmen, Italians. We all live much the same. We are ruled over by kings who claim their thrones by the will of God. Barons, princes, dukes, and lords, they too claim their power by divine will. In fact, in our age, people will tell you that whatever you do or whatever happens to you is because God willed it or because the devil sneaked up under your guard. Good morrow, good woman. Are you away to the town? Ours is a mistrustful, a wary age. The result of unhappy experience. The countryside is not a safe place for travelers. But the safety in numbers. Where are you going on the King's Highway? We are pilgrims. Pilgrims, eh? Well, be on your way. An ounce of caution is worth ten pounds of regret. God speed you, gentlemen and ladies. God speed. Are you bound for Canterbury? Aye, and the new cathedral. Were those the king's men who passed? So they said. What difference when a soldier steals as much as any thief? Beware of soldiers. It's a hard life. Disease kills every fifth child. A man of 40 is already thought to have lived a long life. A plague recently killed one third of all the people in Europe. Famines are frequent. Death is always with us. We hang our criminals, even for stealing sheep. And we leave them to rot where they will discourage others. Are you dismayed? Oh, come, it's not so bad. Men and women have the ability to make a life for themselves in any age. They may weep, but they will also laugh. They may think of heaven, but they are also concerned with earth. You have only to listen to them, to hear the life in them ripple like water down a stony brook. You see, as in all the ages of mankind, we speak with more than one voice. And if you would want to know it, why then, you must listen to a sampling of them all. We built this, a cathedral. More, we invented it, just like the university. We invented them both, a temple of God and a place for man to learn about himself. They are the highest achievements of our age. When I say we built this, I mean just that. None of your architects. Just a master builder, as every large town has, and the people of that town, each giving his labor and working at the thing that he does best. It is almost a miracle, wrought by very human hands, to look on it and to be able to say, I helped raise that, is 
to feel a spark of greatness. A man needs that in any age. We worship here. We even see plays in church. In a time when so few people can read, plays are a way of teaching. The church uses them to present its lessons about life and death. This is one of the religious dramas of our times called Everyman. It's to remind us that there is not only a today, but also an eternity. <laughs> Give you a good cheer, good neighbor. <laughs> Every man stand still. Whither are you going thus gaily? Have you forgot your maker? What messenger are you? I am death. Who fears no man. For every man I take, and no man spare. For it is God's commandment that all to me should be obedient. O oh, death, you come when I had you least in mind. Yet in your power it lies to save me. Of my money I will give you if you will be kind. Yes, a thousand pounds shall you have if you defer this matter till another day. Every man that may not be in any way. I set no store by gold nor silver, nor by pope, emperor, king, duke, nor prince. For if I would receive gifts great all the world I might get. But my custom is clean contrary, I give thee no respite. Come hence and not tarry. Alas, shall I have no longer respite? I may say that death gives no warning. To think on you makes my heart sick. For all unready is my book of reckoning. It avails you not to weep and pray. Death, if I should this pilgrimage take, and my reckoning surely make, show me for Saint Charity, should I not come again shortly? No, every man. If you be once there, you may never more come here. Trust me. Gracious God, in the high seat celestial, have mercy on me in this most need. Shall I have no company from this veil terrestrial of my acquaintance that way me to lead? Yes, if any be so hardy that would go with you and bear you company. Oh, wretched spirit, whither shall I flee that I might escape this endless sorrow? Now, gentle death, Spare me till tomorrow, that I may amend me with good warning. Nay, thereto I will not consent. Nor any man will I respite, but to the heart suddenly smite. And now, out of thy sight I will go. See that you make you ready shortly. For you may say, now is the day. That no man living may escape away. Oh, how we hope and pray our souls may go to heaven. But in the meantime, there is the business of living on earth. We call this a castle, or a keep, and a damp, drafty old thing it is. The nobility living castle, you know, the ruling class. As a matter of fact, most of them have nothing to rule over except a pile of rocks. But still, they are lords and ladies. And by that very fact, different from the rest of us. Being different. They have to behave differently. <laughs> and that is not always easy. So they have a code of chivalry, which all of them are supposed to respect as the rule of their lives. In these, shall we say, precarious times, 
any and all rules of behavior are much needed. This is a very noble code indeed. There are even some who live up to it. A true knight will fight only on the side of justice and of God and to defend his honor. True knight will always be gentle and kind to lesser folk. The honor of a lady is sacred to a true knight. A true knight will always be merciful and kind to the weak, to children and women. Especially to ladies. <laughs> In our time, the honor of ladies is to be considered. Well, it's almost their only protection. The law isn't very effective, and the church can only appeal to the conscience. So who and what is to stand between these weak creatures and the dangers and hardships of our world? So the chaplain of the Countess of Champagne has drawn up a set of rules of courtly love. Marriage is no reason for not loving. No one can be bound by a double love. No one should be deprived of love without the best of reasons. <laughs> love is always a stranger in the house of avarice. God's blood. Where's the wench? Bring wine! More wine! A true lover does not desire anyone but his beloved. They who are not jealous cannot love. Every lover regularly turns pale in the presence of his beloved. A true lover thinks nothing good except what will please his beloved. Love can deny nothing to love. Nothing forbids one woman being loved by two men. Or one man by two women. Love is the deepest and most burning of feelings and the most eternal of games. What man can call himself a poet unless he is first a lover? The greatest poet of our time is an Italian called Dante. Did you know that all of his writing was inspired by love for one woman whom he never met? Listen as he makes her and all women seem heavenly beings, pure and ideal, remote from any of the imperfections of this world. My lady looks so gentle and so pure when yielding salutation by the way that the tongue trembles and has naught to say and the eyes which fain would see may not endure. She is so pleasant in the eyes of men that through the sight the inmost heart doth gain a sweetness which needs proof to know it by. And from between her lips there seems to move a soothing spirit that is full of love, saying forever to the soul, Oh, sigh. It is the art of love to know the proper words to use for the proper lady. In our time, marriage comes at an early age. The church finds this an admirable manner for keeping young people out of trouble. Families encourage it. Most marriages are contracted for convenience. Marriage joins families. It increases mutual protection. A handsome daughter is a family asset. Ask any married woman. They each have their tale of married bliss and woe. You there! What are you about? Stop! Stop that man! Stop! Oh, but I 
telling you. Ah, yes, women. Married women. Their tales of married bliss and woe. The most colourful story is that told by the wife of Bath. A tale set down by Geoffrey Chaucer. Chaucer is the greatest storyteller of our age. The people in his Canterbury Tales are real people. You meet them all in everyday life. Master Chaucer and his characters are firmly on this earth. And none is earthier than Mistress Alison. And certainly no one knows more about married bliss and woe. Lord, since the time I was 12 years of age, thanks be to God forevermore alive, at the church door, I've wedded husband five. Though church authorities might censure me, and all were worthy men in their degree. To tell the truth, these husbands that I had, three of them were good, and two were bad. But good Lord Christ, whenever I remember my youth, the fun I've had, and all the laughter, tickles my heart's roots with pure delight. This very day, it makes my spirits bright that I have had my world in my own time. But age, alas, that poisons every prime, bereft me of my beauty and my juice. Well, let them go. The devil take my youth. The flower is gone. There is no more to tell. The dried up stalk as best I can, I sell. But I'm a merry sort. I still can play. Now, of my last husband, I've more to say. My fifth husband, whose soul I pray God blesses, whom I took out of love and not for riches, had been a student for a term at Oxford. But he'd left school and come back home to board with my best friend, a lady in the town. God save her soul, her name was Alison. My fourth husband was away that Lent. And I will say that, being provident of marriage, I've never long been a widow. And as this lad and I walked in the meadow, we laughed and played and fell in dalliance to such extent that in my providence, I spoke to him and said that he, if I were widow, should soon marry me. When my fourth husband lay beside his grave, I grieved all day, made my face look brave, as good wives should, because it is in place, and with my kerchief covered up my face. But since I had already picked a mate, I wept but little for my widowed state. They bore my husband to the church next morrow. The neighbors came, their faces filled with sorrow. And John, the student, comforted my woe. God knows. The moment that I saw him go after the corpse, I thought he had a pair of legs and hips so handsome, strong and fair that all my heart I gave to him to hold and married him before the month was old. I gave to him the money, lands and houses that I'd collected from my other spouses. This action I regretted in a week, by God. One time he hit me on the cheek because I grabbed his book and tore a page. We had a mort of trouble and heavy weather, but in the end, we made it up together. And when he said to me, my own true wife, I will not ask how you conduct your life, but guard your honor and my good estate. After that day, we never had debate. I was as kind to him in every way as any wife from Denmark to Marseille, and just as true. And so is he to me. And I pray God, who sits in majesty, to bless his soul through all eternity. Ours is a simpler age. We see things more clearly. At least I think we do. Love and death, 
two important ingredients in man's lot on earth. But there is a third. Money. It's market day in town. much bartering done this day. But bartering is the old way. Today the sharpest trading will be for money. Hard coin. Farthings and francs. Dinars and shillings. A leper. There are many of them. They live outside the towns and they depend on the local people to leave food for them. Times are in change. Towns are growing. Money is becoming important. Thank you. With money, a serf can buy his freedom. A vassal can make of himself a prosperous merchant. And a merchant can become worthy to advise a king or lend him money. And often that is the same thing. So money can ennoble, but it can also corrupt. There is a poem much quoted among our students which the unknown author called Sir Penny. Good people, gather round and listen. Come on, I have something that might amuse you. The hand that holds the heavy purse makes right of wrong, better of worse. Sir Penny binds all bargains fast. Rough is smooth when he has passed. Who but Sir Penny settles wars? He is the prince of councillors. Sir Penny's law no man can budge in courts ecclesiastic. Make room for Penny, ye who judge with consciences elastic. When Sir Penny's voice is heard, the sense of right is sadly blurred. The poor man seldom finds redress, whose one hope is his righteousness. Wherever money's power appears, the poor man finds himself in tears. The best of pleas is brushed aside that has no cash to back it. And awful judgments are denied by those who own the racket. Tell me, young sir, is this your own composition? No, it is a student poem, a thing which we students know. It is treasonous. Oh, surely only truthful. It leads to mistrust and despair. I could well see its effect upon these people who listened with such eagerness. Eagerness? Not I. Not I. Evil troublemaker. Oh, 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 ladies and gentlemen. Oh, I'm down there. Let's be hasty, please. Supper. A bad day indeed that did not bring in the midst of challenge its own opportunity. <laughs> Our people are easily frightened. It's the unrest of the age and of the world. In times of plenty, people burst with joy. In times of despair, they droop with grief. And in between, they peer with suspicion. It was always thus. But we have happy times, and there will be death without their relief. We play and sing and dance, and I declaim. Let's leave behind our studies. To play the fool is nice, 
Let's take the joys of being young before we pay the price. And let the old men give themselves their solemn good advice. We're bound to school books. What a bore when old age comes so fast. The spring is tempting. All the more because it will not last. To live. That is a joy in itself in any age. The accomplishments we leave behind, they give to man a kind of immortality. His poems, his words. These are the voices of his age. Well, I'm on my way. Farewell. You are good companions, but it's a long way from where I stand to where you are. Don't you agree? Or is it? Mm -hmm.